So let's take a look at improper integrals. Now some common ways you can identify improper integrals are when the bounds are either to infinity or negative infinity, or when you're trying to find the integral of a function that is discontinuous. Now before we start, we need to learn about two different terms, divergent and convergent. So in this video, I'll label divergent as just D, and I'll label convergent as just C. So the definition of divergent is gonna be that we go to infinity or negative infinity. So for example, if we say that an integral is divergent, that means that when we evaluate the integral, our answer is either infinity or negative infinity. However, if we say that the integral is convergent, that means when we evaluate the integral, we get some real value rather than just infinity or negative infinity. So once again, if we get infinity or negative infinity, we say that it's divergent. And if we get some real value like negative two or square root of three, etc., we say that the integral is convergent. Now moving on to the next section, let's say we have the integral from one to infinity of one over the variable x raised to a power p times dx. Notice p is just gonna be the exponent. So if p is less than or equal to one, we know that this integral is divergent. And if p is greater than one, we know that this integral is convergent. And this only applies if the integral is in the exact same form. Once again, we have it from one to infinity, and it needs to have one over the variable x raised to a power p. And also keep in mind that because we have infinity as one of the bounds, it tells us that this is an example of an improper integral. So for these next set of problems, let's go ahead and determine whether each integral is convergent or divergent, and then we can evaluate those that are convergent. So for number one, we have the integral from negative infinity to negative one of one over the square root of two minus w times dw. Now, because we have negative infinity as one of our bounds, we know that this integral is improper. And so the first step to solving improper integrals or evaluating improper integrals is to set up limit notation. So we have the limit. Now we need to find which bound makes the integral improper. Well, obviously we already talked about it. It's that negative infinity. So we can pick any variable now. We can say the limit, let's just say as t approaches that improper bound. So as t approaches negative infinity of the integral. Now once again, we said as t approaches negative infinity. So we can go ahead and replace negative infinity with t. So we have the limit as t approaches negative infinity of the integral from t to negative one of that same function. So one over the square root of two minus w times dw. So once again, because this integral was improper because of that negative infinity, we have to set up limit notation. And the reason why that is, is if you directly plug in negative infinity into the function after you integrate it, well, obviously we don't know what that exact value is, but we do know what the limit is. And so in order to evaluate this integral, I can just use u substitution. So I'll set u equal to two minus w. So we go ahead and set u equal to two minus w. So then du, or the derivative of two minus w, is gonna be negative one times dw, or negative dw. And then dw, if I isolate that, is gonna equal negative one times du. So now we can plug everything back into the integral, and I'm just gonna forget about the limit just for right now, and I'll come back to it later. So then we have the integral from t to negative one of one over the square root. Now we made two minus w our u, so we're gonna replace that with u and then times du or dw, which is once again equal to negative one times du or just negative du. Now that negative one can come outside the integral. So then we have negative one times the integral from t to negative one of, I'll rewrite one over the square root of u as u to the negative one half power times du. Now the integral of u to the negative one half is just gonna be two u to the one half. Don't forget we do have the negative outside and then when I go ahead and replace back the u, we then get negative two times two minus w raised to the one half power. And now we can evaluate from our bounds of t to negative one. So when I go ahead and evaluate negative two, it's just a constant. So we have negative two times. Now when I plug in negative one into the function for w, we get two minus negative one, which is gonna be two plus one, so three to the one half or square root of three. And then we have, if I rewrite that once again, minus, when I plug in t into the function for w, we have two minus t to the one half, or square root of two minus t. Now don't forget in the very beginning, we did set up a limit notation. So now we go ahead and rewrite that. So we have the limit as t approaches negative infinity of this entire integral, which we have simplified and evaluated to this entire thing. So once again, the limit as t approaches negative infinity of negative two times we have the square root of three, and then minus the square root of two minus t. 
So now to evaluate, we can just use direct substitution and directly plug in negative infinity in for t. So then we have negative two times square root of three and then minus the square root of two minus a negative infinity, which is gonna be plus infinity. Now to go ahead and evaluate this two plus infinity, well two is very insignificant compared to infinity. So two plus a very large number is just gonna be infinity. Now the square root of infinity is still gonna be infinity. So we get negative two times square root of three, and then we have minus what we just said is infinity. Now square root of three is very insignificant once again compared to infinity. So square root of three minus infinity or square root of three minus a very large number is basically gonna be negative infinity. So what we have left is negative two times negative infinity. In this case, the negatives will cancel. Two once again is insignificant compared to infinity. So our final answer is infinity. And because it's infinity, we can say that this integral diverges. Now for number two, we have the integral from negative infinity to infinity of x times e to the negative x squared dx. So notice in this case, we basically have a double improper integral since the lower bound is negative infinity and the upper bound is infinity. And when you have a double improper integral where both the bounds are negative infinity and infinity, what we do here is we split it up into two different integrals. Well, how could we split it up into two different integrals? Now notice that zero is obviously gonna be in between negative infinity to infinity. So we can split this up into the first integral ranging from the bottom bound negative infinity to zero of that same function, x times e to the negative x squared dx, and then plus the second integral ranging from zero to infinity of once again that same function, x times e to the negative x squared times dx. So once again, because zero is in between those two bounds, or is a value that's in between, we can split this up into two different integrals involving both the bounds and zero. Now obviously in both of these integrals, we have the negative infinity and the infinity, which makes both of them improper. So we go ahead and set up limit notation. So for the first integral, we have the limit Let's go ahead and use the variable t. The limit as t approaches, obviously the improper bound is negative infinity of the integral. Well, we obviously replace that with t. So the integral from t to zero of x times e to the negative x squared dx. And then we have plus the limit, the second limit notation here as t approaches. In this case, our improper bound is infinity of the integral from zero. Once again, we're gonna, we're gonna replace infinity with t so the integral from zero to t of x times e to the negative x squared times dx. So starting off with the integral on the left here, if I go ahead and rewrite it, once again, similar to the previous problem, I'm gonna come back to the limit. So we have the integral from t to zero of x times e to the negative x squared times dx. Now this is obviously just a simple u substitution problem. I'm gonna set u equal to negative x squared. So then du, or the derivative of negative x squared is negative two x dx. So then dx, if I isolate, equals du over negative two x. Now if I go ahead and substitute everything back into the integral, we have the integral from t to zero of x times e to the, once again, we made negative x squared our u. So e to the u times dx, dx once again is equal to du over negative two x. Realize that the x's will cancel. Negative one, one half can come outside the integral as a constant. So we have negative one half times the integral from t to zero of e to the u du. Now obviously the integral of e to the u is just e to the u. So we have negative one half times e to the u, and I can go ahead and replace back our u, which once again is negative x squared. So now I can go ahead and evaluate from our bounds of t to zero. So evaluating here, obviously negative one half is a constant. So we have negative one half times when I go ahead and plug in zero into the function for x, we have e to the negative zero squared, which is just gonna be e to the zero, which is one, minus, when I plug in t into the function, we have e to the negative t squared. Now, once again, don't forget, we did set up a limit, so let's go ahead and use limit notation. So we have the limit as t approaches negative infinity of the integral from t to zero of x e to the negative x squared dx, which we have simplified all the way down to this. So we have the limit as t approaches negative infinity, once again, of negative one half times one minus e to the negative t squared. So now I can just go ahead and use direct substitution, directly plugging in negative infinity for t squared. So then we get negative one half times one minus e to the negative t squared. So we have negative one times t, which once again, we're gonna directly substitute negative infinity, and then we square that. 
So then simplifying, we have negative 1 half times 1 minus, now negative infinity squared is just going to be infinity, and then negative 1 times infinity is going to be negative infinity. So we have 1 minus e to the negative infinity, and I'm going to go ahead and rewrite e to the negative infinity as 1 over e to the infinity. Now if you think about it, e to the infinity is going to be a very large number, and 1 over a very large number is basically going to be 0. So we have negative 1 half times 1 minus 0. 1 minus 0 is 1, and then 1 times negative 1 half is going to give us our negative 1 half. Now keep in mind that we're halfway basically because we found this integral, or the limit of the integral, to be negative 1 half, and then we have plus. So now we have to evaluate this integral here. But the good thing is we already know what the integral e to the negative x squared is, so we can go ahead and rewrite it as, I'm going to come back to the limit and say the integral from 0 to t of x times e to the negative x squared dx. Now once again we've already saw this before, the integral of negative or x times e to the negative x squared dx is just going to be negative one half times e to the negative x squared. Now we can go ahead and evaluate from our bounds of zero to t. So when I plug in t for x, when it, once again negative one half is just a constant, so we have negative one half times, when I plug in t for x we have e to the negative t squared, and then we have minus, when I plug in zero for x we have e to the negative zero squared which is e to the zero, which is one. Don't forget we do have limit notation outside the integral, so we rewrite it as the limit as t approaches infinity of negative one half times e to the negative t squared minus one. Now once again, let's go ahead and use direct substitution, so we have negative one half times e to the negative infinity squared, and then we have minus one. Now infinity squared is just going to be infinity, and negative one times infinity is going to be negative infinity. So let's go ahead and rewrite it as negative one half times e to the negative infinity. Once again, we can rewrite it as one over e to the infinity, and then minus one. Now e to the infinity is obviously going to be a very large number. One over e to the infinity, or one over a very large number, is zero. So we basically have negative one half times zero minus one. 0 minus 1 is negative 1, and negative 1 times negative 1 half is going to give us an answer of 1 half. So we basically have negative 1 half plus the limit of this entire integral, which we have found to be 1 half. So then negative 1 half plus 1 half is going to give us our final answer of 0. So we can see that this integral is convergent to the value of 0. Now for number 3, we have the integral from negative 2 to 3 of 1 over x to the fourth dx. Now you might be thinking at first, what makes this integral improper? Well, if we go ahead and actually graph 1 over x to the 4th, it's going to look similar to 1 over x squared, just a little bit steeper. This might be something like this, just a rough drawing here. Now, if we're trying to find the integral, or the area under the curve of the function of 1 over x to the 4th from negative 2 to 3, it's going to look something like this, if I could put it in blue. So notice we're trying to find an area under an infinite discontinuity there. So that is what makes the integral improper. And also, if we go ahead and analytically find the discontinuities, we can go ahead and set this denominator equal to zero, because we know obviously this function is discontinuous when we divide by zero. So if x to the fourth equals zero, then x equals zero. So we can say at x equals zero, this function is discontinuous. And notice that x equals zero is in between the bounds where x equals negative two and x equals three. So because, once again, the discontinuity is within the range of the bounds of integration, we can say that this integral is improper. Now once again, because it's improper, we do set up limit notation. But in this case, the bound that makes the integral improper is not either the top bound or the bottom bound, but instead it's in between the two bounds of integration. So in this case, we still separate into two different integrals, but now we have the integral from the bottom bound, which is negative two, to the bound that makes the integral improper, which is obviously zero, of 1 over x to the fourth dx, and then plus the integral from 0, once again the bound that makes the integral improper, to the top bound which is 3, of once again that same function 1 over x to the fourth times dx. So now we can go ahead and set up limit notation. So we have the limit as t approaches 0 of the integral from negative 2 to 0 of 1 over x to the fourth dx, and then plus we have the second limit as t approaches 0 of the integral from t to 3 of 1 over x to the 4th times dx. Now before I set up limit notation, I'm actually going to go ahead and redraw this graph of 1 over x to the 4th. So once again, it looks something like this. 
Now in order to find the area under the curve, this is going to be the integral. Now for the left integral here, the integral from negative 2 to 0, so obviously you have negative 2 to 0 of the same function 1 over x to the fourth dx. Notice the integral, or the area under the curve, is going to approach 0, the x value of 0, from the left hand side. So we're going to rewrite the limit notation as the limit as t approaches that same improper bound 0, but this time from the left hand side, so from the negative direction of the integral from negative 2 to t of 1 over x to the fourth times dx. And then we have plus the second integral. We set up a limit here, the limit as t approaches. Now our area under the curve where the integral is from 0 to 3. Obviously there is a discontinuity there at x equals 0. And from the integral from 0 to 3, which is obviously this shaded area here, we're actually approaching the discontinuity from the right hand side this time. So I'm going to rewrite it as the integral or the limit as t approaches 0 from the positive direction or from the right hand side of the integral from t to 3 of once again that same function 1 over x to the fourth times dx. So evaluating the integral on the left first, once again I'll come back to the limit. We have the integral from negative 2 to t of, I'll rewrite 1 over x to the fourth as x to the negative fourth power dx. And so the integral of x to the negative fourth, once again we just use the power rule, is going to be x to the negative third over negative 3. And so we can rewrite it as negative 1 over 3 x cubed. Now I can go ahead and evaluate from the bounds of negative 2 to t. So when I go ahead and evaluate this, I'll go ahead and plug in t for x first, and we'll get negative 1 over 3t cubed. And then we have minus, when I plug in negative 2 in for x, we then have negative 1 over 3 times negative 2 cubed, which is going to be negative 8. So then we have negative 1 over 3t cubed once again. And then we have minus, well in this case we have negative 1 over 3 times negative 8, which is negative 24. Negative 1 over negative 24 is just going to be 1 over 24. So we have minus a positive 1 over 24. So now that we have simplified our entire integral to this, we go ahead and rewrite our limit. So once again we have the limit as t approaches 0 from the negative direction or from the left hand side of negative 1 over 3t cubed. And then we have minus 1 over 24. Now be careful here because t is approaching not just 0, but 0 from the left hand side or from the negative direction. Now in order to understand what the limit actually is, let's go ahead and graph this on a calculator. So if I go ahead and use my calculator and graph this, the graph of negative 1 over 3t cubed, or in this case I'm going to use x as the variable, so the graph of negative 1 over 3x cubed minus 1 over 24 is going to look something like this. So notice that the limit of this function as t approaches 0 from the left hand side, we're basically going to go up and up towards infinity. So we can go ahead and replace that with infinity. Now we've already found what this limit equals, so now let's go ahead and find the other limit here. So then obviously we have a plus, so we have infinity plus. Now the limit as t approaches 0 from the positive direction of the integral, I'm going to go ahead and rewrite that from t to 3 of 1 over x to the fourth times dx. Obviously we've already figured out what the integral is. So I can go ahead and skip a couple steps. And so the integral of 1 over x to the fourth, or the integral of x to the negative fourth power, is going to be negative 1 over 3x cubed. Now let's go ahead and evaluate from the bounds of t to 3. So when I go ahead and plug in 3 for x, we do get negative 1 over 3 times 3 cubed, so 3 times 27, which is going to give us 81. And then minus, when I plug in t for x, we do get negative 1 over 3t cubed. So now that we have simplified the integral into this, don't forget we do have the limit outside of the integral, so we can go ahead and rewrite the limit as t approaches 0 from the positive direction of, we can just simplify this into negative 1 over 81, double negatives will cancel, and then plus 1 over 3t cubed. Now if I go ahead and graph this function on my calculator, it's going to look something like this. So as we approach the t value of 0, so right in the center, from the positive direction, we're basically going to go up and up towards infinity, similar to the other limit as well. So we can say that the limit as t approaches 0 from the positive direction of this function is equal to infinity. So back to the top here, the left limit is equal to infinity, and then we have plus the right limit, which obviously is also equal to infinity. 
and infinity plus infinity is still going to remain as infinity. And because it is infinity, we can say that the integral diverges.